in case that somebody might actually want to see it later on. So uh, I, I received one question from Andres about this line integral you're supposed to do in the uh, first homework problem. So uh, that it looks something like this. So, this is new. So the question is how, what, what, what's meant by this notation? So let's talk about this rectangle we're looking at. So here's the the interval L in space, and then here's the interval T in imaginary time, it's Euclidean space formulation. So the, let us actually look at the uh, each of the segment here. The first of all, this del, um, the, the oh, oops, this thing here is proportional to g mu nu and some function of x minus y squared. So what it means is that when you integrate over this two, uh, the line integrals, so you you have two line integrals for x and y. Overlapping with each other, but when you do this integral, let's say you integrate over x for this segment here. Then the uh, the dark picks dx mu element along the, uh, the imaginary time direction. And because of this g mu nu here, I changed the color somehow, because of g mu nu here, when dx mu is along the imaginary time direction, so namely that mu direction is zero, then g mu nu selects new direction to be also zero. So the y integral would contribute only for this segment. So maybe this is when I am supposed to use color here. So this segment here, and that segment here for the y integral, but not this, uh, 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 this one here or that one over here. So if I choose this x integral uh, from uh, uh, the zero to t dx zero, then I have this g zero zero dx minus y squared. And then y integral is only along z, oops, zero t dy zero when x y one is l so here's zero l t and minus zero two dy zero where y one is zero so I have an integral over dx naught, an integral over dy naught, and then d x minus y squared is x naught minus y naught squared plus x one minus y one squared. But for these two segments here, then there's no spatial uh, distance. On the other hand, for the second portion here, I have zero to t dx naught zero to t d y naught and d the same time difference squared but the spatial difference squared is fixed with l squared because of this distance here so that takes care of the part of this uh, uh, the path uh, the uh, uh, the line integral where i pick this dx zero to be along this side Th does this answer part of the question andre Andres? Yeah, yeah, it does answer part of the question. Here, so okay, then, and you keep doing the same thing. So next thing you do is that you pick this segment of x integral. And again, because of this g mu nu thing, the only pieces of the y integral that would contribute would be this portion here and this portion there, but not on the, uh, the size. So 
This piece doesn't contribute. This piece doesn't contribute. Oops. Ooh. So what I was trying to say here is that when you pick um, this portion of x integral, then the only portion of y integral you need to consider is this one and that one. And then again, according to this uh, argument of the function d, then here you don't have any uh, uh, time interval between this line and that line, but you do have interval along the time direction. I'm uh, sorry, the spatial direction x1 minus y1 squared. On the other hand, when you're looking at the y integral along this direction, then you have definite time interval t. And then you have this uh, also time, uh, the spatial differences. So that would be x1 minus y1 squared plus L squared. So that would be the integral uh, uh, along this uh, horizontal direction. And you just keep doing it for this interval for x again, this interval for x again in the same way. And so each time, the only contributions you have to look at is the parallel direction for y because of the g mu business. And then you just write out this uh, x minus y squared explicitly using this interval lt and integration variables. And all of these integrals can be done analytically. And uh, you know, I, I'm lazy, I just let the mathematica do it for me and just sum up all the, uh, the, the four sides at the end of the day. And then you already see in the case of the one plus one dimension, that actually leads to area law of the Wilson loop. The Wilson loop looks like e to the minus something LT. So that really shows up already uh, from the very beginning. In the case of the, the, four, uh, the four dimensions, then expression here looks a little bit complicated. So you need to do an expansion when T is much bigger than L to find out that it's actually the Coulomb potential times T. Of course, you know, the, in the Euclidean space, there's no difference between space and time. So if I had done the opposite expansion, you end up being one over T times L instead. So the, 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 what you find in the integrand is a, such a function so that depending on which unit, uh, uh, limit you take, you either get t over l or l over t. But it's just a, a simple expansion around the uh, uh, when uh, either t or l is much larger than the other one. So that's the way uh, this uh, problem uh, should be done. So just to summarize, we still have to split up the line integral over all those four uh, lines, but we just have to expand out the initial expression. Uh, well, well, well so let's see. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what, what exactly you meant by this. So let me hopefully repeat what I'm saying here. So, so like that, that loop was made out of four like parts, right? We're still going to have to integrate over all four parts. That's right. But we do this expansion before we integrate every single time. So what I'm saying is that if I look at this part of the x integral, then I'm supposed to do this part of the y integral and this part of the y integral. So here I have two integrals I'm supposed to do. Next, if I want to do x integral along this direction, then I have to do y integral both in this direction and that direction. So I have two integrals to do. And then I go to this side for the x, then I have, again, two y integrals. When I go to this side of the x, I have two y integrals. So all together, there are eight integrals. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that is what it is. Okay. Yeah. But uh, actually, uh, the, you don't need to do all eight of them because uh, 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 the many of them actually end up being the same. So at the very end of the day, you only need to do two integrals. Uh, 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 yeah, two integrals. and, and uh, that if I have done this integral, then this can be obtained just by interchanging L and T. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. I hope this makes sense to everybody. Uh, any questions about this? Okay, so that was the question I got from Andres. Uh, are there any other questions? People want to ask. 
I'm not seeing anything on chat window either. Okay, uh, I didn't prepare particular slides, but uh, one of the questions that was asked last week, and I didn't get to it, is this uh, connection between the gauge theory and a fiber bundle. And uh, let me first show the slide I have shown in lecture before. And that is the slide I have shown, uh, 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 I think, uh, already two weeks ago, it looks like. And so that's, that's this idea of the fiber bundle, namely that the fiber bundle is made of what is called the base manifold, which is what corresponds to our space and time. And on each point in space and time, you have what is called the fiber. And, and so that fiber is internal space on which the gauge invariance acts on. And uh, so the, typically we're talking about, let's say uh, some uh, Dirac field or something, and Dirac field corresponds to each of these fibers. And as we also talked about today, if you have SUN gauge theory, then the quark Dirac field will come with NC colors. So each of these fiber is actually NC dimensional vector space. And when you have psi as a function of space time, this sort of uh, cuts across these fibers at many different points on space time. And you call that a section of the fiber bundle or a section of a vector bundle to be correct. So, so when each of these fiber is a vector space, like in the case of NC dimensional column vector for the Dirac field, then if you cut across this uh, fiber bundle, uh, then you define a section, which means that at every point in space-time, these black dots, you occupy a particular place in this fiber direction, namely that psi has a value as a function of x and t, so that is what is called the section of the vector bundle. So what's kind of strange about this idea of fiber bundle is that when we think of space normally, we only think of the space-time, uh, because that's labeled by uh, a space-time coordinates x and t. But the whole concept of fiber bundle is trying to mix that up together with what value a field takes as a function of x and t, and you consider this whole space, including both this external space-time and internal degrees of freedom, as a part of the same manifold, which is what is called the bundle, and from the bundle, which includes both internal and external spaces, you can always project back on the external space alone, meaning that you just eliminate this fiber direction and just go back to space-time points only. So that's how this fiber bundle is defined mathematically. So you start with some big space, which contains both the external space-time possession and the internal vector space of, of the, let's say, quark fields or whatever. And then out of that big space, you define a projection back onto the space-time only, and, and that projection is what defines the fiber bundle. And uh, there's a, actually a, a paper which uh, introduced this connection, to my knowledge, the first time in physics, which is the, due to uh, 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 C.N. Yan, and C.N. Yan is a Nobel laureate who uh, 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 developed the theory of the uh, uh, of the, the parity violation uh, together with Sao uh, 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 Dun Li, I think. And, and uh, maybe if some of you speak Chinese, uh, correct my pronunciation. And uh, here is the paper. concept of non-integral phase factors in gro global formulation of gauge fields. And that's uh, back in 1975. And uh, it, it talks about, for example, Dirac monopole, a magnetic monopole, a Hanger bohm phase, and, and things like that. But towards the end, they actually put together this little table called translation of terminology. And this is a terminology we use in physics about gauge theory. And this is the terminology mathematicians used in the context of fiber bundle. And here's the sort of dictionary. And the first one is called gauge or global gauge. And here it says principal coordinate bundle. And the idea of the principal bundle 
is that if you go back to the picture I had earlier, on each point in space-time, you had vector space. And that was what I called the vector bundle. But you can also put the gauge group itself on each point in space-time. So in the case of the electromagnetism, then gauge theory is based on U1 group, and U1 is nothing but a, a little circle. So for every point in space-time, you place a little circle. And uh, so the picture then would look something like this. So you have some kind of space time here. And on every point, you put this little circle. And the way you go from one place to another uh, is, is defined by uh, uh, the, the, this connection, that's a gauge field. And that tells you how you are supposed to do a parallel transport, let's say, on this space-time point, and suppose you are here, to another space-time point, let's say you are here, and there, and so on. And that's what we talked about as this link variable. So this defines the parallel transport. From one point to another, and that defines what mathematicians call connection and what we physicists call the, uh, uh, the gauge field. So back to that uh, paper by uh, uh, C and Yon. So uh, that is talked about here, connection on the principal fiber bundle and here it says gauge potential. And I think this is sort of the old name. Uh, so we, uh, these days probably call it gauge field instead of gauge potential. But anyway, so you know what I'm talking about. So a mu field in our case is what corresponds to the connection on a principal fiber bundle. And the connection uh, and the relationship between this principal bundle and vector bundle is simply that in the case of the principal bundle, you, act, you use this connection to map one point in this so-called to another point in so-called at a neighboring space-time point. And, and th th that's given by this uh, action, given by this link variable VJI. And, and you just let VJI act on the vector space instead of a space of the group, uh, group manifold. So the action is the same, but they basically correspond to different representation of the uh, gauge symmetry. And then, uh, uh, so uh, you use the same connection, but in a different representation, so that it acts on either space of the gauge group itself or space of this vector space of the representation of the, of the gauge symmetry. So uh, that's this uh, connection. Transition function is something we haven't talked about. So the idea is that when you actually, uh, uh, again, go back to uh, 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 the whiteboard, you have some kind of space time. And the transition function is defined when you actually have these overlapping regions in space time. And when you go from this patch to the next patch, then what you have defined uh, as your theory here and what you have defined over here may have a different gauge. So when you go from here to there, you need to do a particular gauge transformation, which is defined on the overlap between these spaces. And when you go for this patch to that patch, then again, you need to do a gauge transformation defined over this overlap region. And from here to there, again, the same thing. And so what gauge transformation you're supposed to do to go from one patch to next is what is called the transition function. And uh, this may not be uh, familiar to some of you, but this actually comes out to be very important when you talk about magnetic monopoles. Because when you have a sphere and you place a magnetic monopole in the middle, and then you try to understand what the vector potential looks like on the surface of the magnetic, uh, on, on this, uh, uh, the region surrounding this magnetic monopole. 
But you know, ahead of the time, whenever you write the magnetic field as a curl of the vector potential, then the divergence identically vanishes. So it looks like you cannot describe the magnetic monopole using a vector potential. So that's exactly where this transition function comes in place. So what you do is define your vector potential on the northern hemisphere. That's the patch which corresponds to this texture. You also define a vector potential on the southern hemisphere. And where the northern and southern hemispheres overlap, that's along the equator, which corresponds to this overlap region, you do a gauge transformation in such a way that the vector potential in northern hemisphere is related to the vector potential in the southern hemisphere by a gauge transformation along the equator. So if you allow this additional gauge degree of freedom in changing the description in the northern hemisphere to changing a description in the southern hemisphere, this in turn allows you to actually uh, uh, have a uh, constant magnetic field emanating uh, from this sphere completely. So this is not something you normally do on a flat, flat space time because you can use the in, a single pass to describe the entire space. But when you want to describe this uh, magnetic field on the surface of the sphere, you divide up the surface into two patches. You glue them together uh, where they overlap, namely along the equator. And that's how you can describe the magnetic monopole where the magnetic field is emanating constantly uh, from, from, from the origin. Um, so this is what the mathematicians call transition function. And again, this is nothing but just a particular form of using gauge transformation uh, going from one region of space-time to another. But anyway, so that's what this transition function. Parallel displacement or parallel transport is something that we already talked about already. So you use this gauge field A mu, you define this uh, uh, the e to the i A mu dx mu along the line integral so that you can do a fair comparison of, uh, uh, let's say, a section of the vector uh, bundle at one particular space time point to another space time point. And uh, the, the homework problem you have uh, just done, uh, uh, use, use that this actual parallel transport so that you could compare the matter field at site I and site J and in such a way that that would reduce to the covariant derivative when you actually take the continuum limit. So uh, that's the parallel displacement uh, of parallel transport, uh, which corresponds to really this uh, line integral, the gauge field. And we also talked about this curvature uh, in the uh, fiber bundle is what corresponds to the field strength in the uh, 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 the, gauge, uh, uh, the physics uh, speak. And again, this is something you have verified. So if you uh, multiply this uh, link variable along the plaquette on the side of a square, then the product of these link variables uh, tells you how the, the let's say, a, a field would change after going around the loop and which corresponds to how much space is curved. And, and, and you also worked out that that precisely corresponds to the, uh, the uh, area integral of the field strength or the, the, uh, the uh, uh, of, uh, so that's something like a magnetic flux going through this uh, plaquette. And so that's the correspondence between the curvature and the field strengths. So that's how you can see the one-to-one -one correspondence between the terminology in a fiber bundle in mathematics and a terminology of the gauge field in physics. And the rest is just a specialization to a particular choice of the gauge group. So it says electromagnetism is what corresponds to a fiber bundle based on a U1 group. What, Yang, uh, the, the, what C and Yang calls isotopic spin gauge field is what in modern days is what we use in a standard model based on SU2 gauge group. And so what C. N. Yan uh, had in mind in his paper with Mills is that the uh, gauging isospin is a way of getting ISO, SU2 uh, gauge group. That's not the modern view of any more, more isospin symmetry. It's just an accidental symmetry where up quark and down quark have much lighter masses compared to strong scale. So to the extent you ignore their masses, 
up and down quark would appear to be the same. Hence, you can do a SU2 rotation between them. And that's not a gauge symmetry in the modern view. Uh, it's just a global symmetry. So that has nothing to do with the fiber bundle gauge symmetry. Instead, what we are talking about in standard model is what is called the weak isospin, where you rotate uh, between the left-handed component only of the up quark and down quark. And that is a gauge symmetry in the standard model based on SU2 gauge group. So that's this connection here. And I briefly mentioned this direct magnetic monopole. I hope to come back and talk about magnetic monopole um, in more detail when we talk about these topological aspects of the, the quantum field theory. And, and this quantization of magnetic monopole corresponds to what is called the classification of the U1 uh, bundle. And, and this is something called Chan class. This is one of the topological invariants which you can talk about in classifying what kind of fiber bundles are possible on, based on given a, 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 the, the a gauge group, in this case U1. And I forgot to mention another terminology which is not on this table. So what mathematicians call structure, uh, 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 um, uh, oh, let's see, do I remember this correctly? Structure group, I believe, of fiber bundle is what corresponds to the gauge group in, in the gauge theory. So in this case, we're talking about the structure group of U1, and, and that corresponds to gauge invariance of the U1 gauge symmetry. And so the, the, what this furniture class that tells you is basically the magnetic charge of the magnetic monopole. And if you don't have any magnetic monopole, then you have a trivial U1 bundle. When you do have a magnetic monopole, you have a non-trivial U1 bundle. So in that case, what you have is the SU2, sorry, the, uh, the surface of the sphere, S2 as your base space. You're putting this little circle U1 on top of it. It turns out that in the case of non-trivial U1 bundle, this base space, namely space of SU2, uh, the S2, and what's uh, sitting on top of it, which is the, uh, the uh, one uh, little circle on top of that, ends up glued together and you have this U1 on top of every point so together this two-dimensional surface and one-dimensional direction of the circle on, on every point it turns out that will bring you actually a three-dimensional sphere so this is how the fiber bundle really intertwines the notion of space-time and what's sitting on top of it as an internal space, an internal space of one circle, an external space of two-dimensional sphere gets intertwined in such a way that the whole thing ends up being three-dimensional sphere. And from this three-dimensional sphere, you define what they call the projection. is usually denoted by symbol pi, which is the projection of going back from S3 down to S2. And when you have S3 projected down on S2, this is what mathematicians call Hopf bundle. So namely that non-trivial fiber bundle is very strange. Even though you're putting S1 on top of every point in, in S2, the end result is not S2 cross S1, but ends up being S3. And then you say this is a non-trivial bundle. This case is a trivial bundle. And a trivial case is just a simple tensor product of the base, uh, uh, base space, namely this is space time, times what's sitting on every point, that's a fiber. But when you have a non-trivial bundle, space time and what's sitting on top of it gets mixed up in a very non-trivial way that you, uh, the entire bundle space is not a simple tensor product of the two. So that's how things work. I don't know if I'm actually answering your question uh, on what you wanted to know. Uh, I think the question came from Tianle, was it? Uh, I think that was me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So am I responding to your questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. It's 
helpful, but I have one more question about the connection. Okay. Great, so, well, go ahead. The, the mathematicians, they usually talk about the connections as differential forms. Um, mm -hmm. But in physics, we regard them as vector fields. Do you know what's the relation between these two terminology? Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. So uh, differential form, is you first define dx mu, it's sort of a line segment, uh, which you use for a line integral, and you define an antisymmetric product of these things. And if you have three of them, that defines actually a three line integrals together. So that defines a volume of an integral. So you that defines a volume integral. And uh, because these are antisymmetric, none of these coordinates can point the same direction. And that's how these three directions end up being independent from each other, so that these three line elements would define a volume element uh, altogether. And in the case of the uh, connection, what you're talking about is what mathematicians call A, which is one form and any one form can be written in any basis uh, 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 system which is given by dx mu and so the coefficient of dx mu is given by a mu with a lower index instead and this a mu is nothing but what we call the vector potential so this expression that the connection is supposed to be one form in mathematics speak is already meant to indicate that this A or vector potential is meant to be integrated over a line segment because after all exponential of this what goes into this uh, uh, parallel transport so talking about differential form for the connection is exactly the same thing as talking about vector potential, which is meant to be integrated uh, along a some, some particular path. Oh, um, Does that make sense? Can, can we say that it's bring down the indices using the metric? So when, when I talk about this the lower and, 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 and the upper indices, uh, I'm not using metric at all. Oh. So uh, dx mu, it what forms the independent basis on what is called the, uh, the, the T star of the manifold. This is cotangent space. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, in differential geometry, you have this derivatives, which form the basis of TM, which is a tangent space. And any vector v on, on a given manifold, so you have some vector sitting on a manifold, can be written using this expression because del del x mu is the basis vector and any vector can be expanded as a linear combination of them and that coefficient is v with mu on the upper index and this can depend on where you are in a space time so this is how you define this upper index for the vector field. Mm. And this cotangent space is supposed to be the, uh, uh, the dual or tangent space. And what's meant by dual is that you can define an inner product between this vector and this, uh, the, the basis of the cotangent space. This, and this inner product is meant to be the Kronecker delta. Mm. So they live on different spaces, one in cotangent space, the other in cotangent space. And then whether your index is upper index or lower index depends on which one you are living in. And when you introduce metric, then that's the point when you introduce an inner product on tangent space times tangent space, not the inner product between tangent space and cotangent space. So that is an extra ingredient, which you don't necessarily have uh, in, uh, in, in mathematician's point of view. Mm. 
So from the point of mathematicians, when you have any manifold, any kind of space time, you can always define a tangent space in cotangent space in a product between cotangent space and tangent space always exist. But in a product between a vector and vector, where both of them live on tangent space, requires extra input, extra data, uh, they say actually data, and that data is the metric. I'm, am I answering your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I understand. <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, the one uh, reference which I found very useful, which I actually studied quite a bit when I was back in grad school, is this uh, uh, paper, or review rather, by uh, Iguchi, Gilkey, and Hansen, published in the Physics Report. And uh, here's the uh, uh, citation. Physics Reports uh, 66 to 213 uh, in, back in 1980. And the title is Gravitational Gauge Theories and Differential Geometry. Uh, I, I think I can place this uh, paper together with this C and Yance paper on uh, among the files and B courses so that you can actually download them uh, where, wherever you are. And, and then the, uh, you can look at this table of contents, the introduction, a concept of manifolds and differential forms. We manual manifolds is where you introduce this additional concept of the metric on top of the regular manifold. And then talks about the fiber bundles and then uh, is connections. Characteristic classes is the Chern class is what I mentioned earlier about magnetic monopole is one kind of characteristic classes. There are other kinds of characteristic classes as well, which are used to classify what kind of uh, geometry you can have for uh, uh, the fiber bundles. And then the index theorem is something uh, I will be talking about hopefully next Tuesday in connection with the anomalies and, and uh, uh, the in case with the, bound, the, for the boundaries. And here you see a mill series, which is really the subject where mathematics and physics language cross. And, and then uh, they uh, talk about general relativity uh, using this kind of language as well. So uh, this was actually a fairly useful review for me and uh, you can look at it uh, at your leisure. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any other questions? Anything about the, the lecture we had this morning? Yeah, actually, I was I was gonna. Does anyone else have any questions? Because I was about to ask them about that. It looks like you're good to go. Okay, cool. So I know we didn't get to like this the slide right next to um, adiabatic expansion. So I was actually wondering if you can go over that like a summary real quick because uh, I think it's part of two C, right? Uh, it, adiabatic expansion. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, not sure. I, I'm not sure I talked I about adiabatic we, expansion. I, I talked yeah, I don't about think adiabatic got to it changes. Too. Oh, adiabatic changes, my bad. That's what, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. We didn't get to that part, right? Yeah, so we didn't get to that part. So so here I talked about the uh, the spectrum of energy levels right. in the absence of the vector potential. So little a is a spatially constant component of the vector potential. Mm -hmm. Then I gradually turn this vector potential on, and that will that will be what we are do we will be doing on on Tuesday, and so you know I can show you the bottom line what happens here. So when you have this kind of spectrum, and the, low, the negative energy states occupied and positive energy states vacant, but as I uh, uh, slowly turn on this vector potential, all these energy levels would move like this. And then the point here is that the spectrum is the same as before, because when vector potential changes from zero to two pi over EL, it turns out that they are uh, equivalent under gauge transformation. So that's why they have the same spectrum, because you know, physics is the same in both cases. So in some sense, you start from no gauge potential to again, no gauge potential up to gauge transformation. But because of this adiabatic change I mentioned, so all states follow energy eigen states all along. That's what's meant by adiabatic change. Then what used to be this occupied negative energy state would end up being an occupied positive energy state. And that's the adiabatic change I was going to talk about on Tuesday, and you're getting the, uh, uh, the preview of this. And then you find 
that there is now a particle at the end of the day because the positive energy state is now occupied. And if you do the same thing for the left mover instead of right mover, you actually lose a particle because what used to be, oops, sorry. And what used to be actually a, uh, 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 the vacant state uh, for the positive energy now turns into a vacant state for negative energy. So then you say there's an antiparticle here. So you produce both the particle and the antiparticle when you do this adiabatic exchange of the vector potential. So the total electric charge is of course conserved, but the chiral charge, when you count the uh, number of right-handed particles minus left-handed particles, then you have changed the chiral charge by two unit. And that's the origin of the anomaly. The chiral symmetry is no longer conserved because of this. So, so what I was trying to get at was that our energy spectrum is those two states taken together, right? That's what you mm -hmm. mean by it doesn't change under the gauge transformation. Right. Okay. Okay. That, that clears it up a lot. Actually. Right. So when we talk about this adiabatic uh, uh, change, and that's the terminology that appears in quantum mechanics uh, 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 literature, where you have some external parameter to the theory, and you slowly change the parameter in such a way that what's sitting on an energy eigenstate would always follow the energy eigenstate, even if you change the parameters. So the, the, the picture here is something like this. So you have some energy levels, and here's the parameter you are changing, whatever that is. And as you change the parameter, the energy levels change. And if you do this change very quickly, if you start out with this particular state here, then you end up with that particular state over here, which you then need to expand as a linear combination of these energy eigenstates. That is what is called a sudden change. But when you do a diabetic change, the state what used to be here would stay on this energy eigenstate, no matter how much you change this parameter lambda. And that is the limit of a diabetic change. So what we are doing uh, in this exercise for this one plus one dimension QED is this adiabatic case where you stay on this energy eigenstate throughout the change. Then you know if you start out here, you end up with, sorry, if you start out here, you end up over there. And that's the, 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 the case we're using for this discussion. Does that explain the meaning of the word adiabatic? Yeah, I, I was okay, just trying right. to see how to do it for this particular thing because it yeah. seemed as though we were trying to show that there's a positive energy state field and that's precisely mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the end of the day, when you have uh, some quantum system, let's say you have some spin or something, then let's say, for example, you gradually change the magnetic field, then you, the, as magnetic field is changed, the spin would follow the magnetic field, and that would be a diabatic uh, transition, a diabatic transition. But if you have a spin, and you have the magnetic field, let's say you all of a sudden change the magnetic field in this, this direction. Then what used to be this spin, then needs to be decomposed into the, the state along this new quantization axis, and you find a linear combination of two different energy eigenstates. And that will be the case of the sudden transition. So in the end, the, you know, the real uh, transition may be somewhere in between. So you have to compare how the energy eigenstates would change as a function of this parameter. So this is the sort of the speed of the change and versus how quickly you change the parameter itself and that comparison will tell you whether you are close to a sudden regime or close to a diabetic regime. And you have a different formula of the transition for each cases in quantum mechanics. Got it. Thank you. Okay.
All right, we still have five more minutes. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? And the stuff I talked about this morning about dynamics of gauge theory is it, sort of something, you know, any practitioner on quantum field theory knows about, but I don't actually know of a particularly good review on it. Um, so uh, I apologize that I don't have a good uh, literature to uh, tell you about, but this is, this is the sort of the best we know about dynamics of gauge theories today. And, and it's, it's certainly not really discussed in Peskin Schroeder because this kind of picture was still not uh, very clear back then. Uh, uh, but now uh, we think we understand things better, uh, even though we are still uh, not uh, quite clear on what's going on with this uh, uh, intermediate range of number of flavors. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is still much a uh, work in progress. And in the case of SU3 QCD theory, the 16 flavors is the limit uh, within this uh, asymptotic freedom. If you go to 17 flavors, the theory becomes IL free. In that limit, we know what's going on because the theory becomes free and you can rely on perturbation theory to discuss the long distance physics. And from somewhere between 16 and maybe 11 flavors or something, people believe that uh, that leads to the infrared fixed point, even though whether it's 11 or 12 or 10, we don't really know. And below that number, uh, that we expect some combination of confinement and chirosymmetry breaking, we still don't really know. And, and only when number of flavor is, let's say, uh, a two, three, four, five or something, we think this uh, chirosymmetry breaking is the right description. And, and where exactly these boundaries is, again, not clearly understood. So uh, there's still lots to be understood about non avian gauge theory. Um, I, just, I have like a terminology question. So, okay. or well, it might be a conceptual misunderstanding actually, but when we say IR fixed point, like I was thinking of the, I was thinking of the fact that there was a scale at which the coupling goes to infinity for in the confined phase as sort of being an IR fixed point. Actually, no. Sorry? Actually, no. Okay. So IR fixed point, corresponds to this kind of behavior. So this is the logarithm of the energy scale. This is the coupling. And if you are in this uh, regime of uh, 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 the NF less than, uh, the, let's say 16, but somewhere above 11 or something in SU3, this is the behavior you expect. If you start with some value of the coupling constant high energy, because the beta function negative starts to grow, but then, it plateaus, it never blows up. Mm -hmm. And this is the critical infrared fixed point coupling, G star. Mm -hmm. And if you compare this picture with what we draw uh, as a function of coupling in a beta function, yeah. this is the behavior uh, uh, which correspond to uh, 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 this, I think. So if you start with a small coupling here, beta function is negative. So as you go to infrared, it starts to grow. Mm -hmm. But when you hit this point, the beta function vanishes. The beta is the change of the coupling as a function of energy scale. So once this vanishes, then G doesn't change anymore. And that's this behavior of plateau. Mm -hmm. And it also, and, com it also mm -hmm. comes into that from above, right? Yes, that's right. So yeah. if you start from here, then it goes down like this. Yeah, yeah. So if you start from here, then it goes down like this. And either way, you end up with this particular coupling in the infrared limit. So that is what is called the infrared fixed point behavior. Mm -hmm. And then, and, so I, and, sorry, I, just to see if I'm... So, so to actually get the... Um, to get the, uh, the G blowing up, you would need like the negative of this beta function. Yeah, that's right. So for G to blow up so that you have the behavior that looks like this instead, and that would require the beta function to be like this. Yeah. But 
in 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 a in like really it should go positive for some really small g right in principle uh why do you say that um i guess i i thought that i thought that like when you actually included the fermions in addition to the gauge the gauge uh term that that you mm -hmm. got a little a small region where it was I don't know. This question came up of how big G has to be to, to actually be in the confining phase. Um, uh, so we expect that G has to be as large as something like four pi, roughly, for the theory to become confining. Okay, but if it's, I guess my question, if it's less than that, is it, if, I, if you zoom way in on the origin, is there a small region where the beta function is positive? Uh, not in none of the engaged theory. Okay. Uh, in four dimensions, at least. Okay. So that when coupling is small, then here we can rely on perturbation theory. We trust it, right? And and within this regime, we found this beta function to be proportional to B naught G cube over four pi squared, where B naught is minus 11, three and C plus two thirds NF. So if NF is not too large, B naught is negative. Mm -hmm. So this behavior is something we believe in. Right, okay. I Whether it keeps going down I'm like confused. this, yeah, okay. right. Whether it keeps going down like this, or it turns around and find the fixed point is, is a, a, a something that requires more study. And the Banks and Zanks discovered that there is at least a range of NF and, F and C where this behavior can be studied within the range of the validity of perturbation theory so that you can believe in it. But in most theories, this fixed point would be outside the scope of the perturbation theory. So that's why you need to have some other mechanism to actually understand if that's true or not. And in the supersymmetric theory, we had an additional handle that we believe that does happen. Without supersymmetry, we are still sort of mostly making educated guesses that that's likely to be the case, but it's very difficult to prove that. Okay. I guess we're it's just, I, I have one follow-up question. Go ahead. If you have time. Yeah, So I guess what I, the, the way that I was trying to think about the, the phase diagram you showed this morning is how sort of exactly how this beta function would look as a function of NF, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's right. When you when you say the exotic dynamics region, like what what can that correspond to in terms of the beta function? Because it sort of seems like if the if asim if if it's just sort of curling up as you turn M NF up, what what can happen other than these two pictures? Could it go like asymptotically close to zero but not actually be zero? Like what is the um... yeah? For for example, suppose the beta function is really just going down uh, uh, forever, and and so that the gauge coupling constant does blow up at some energy scale. So in that case, you kind of expect that you know, every quark and anti-quark are bound together. So the theory is confining. But you may not have the expectation value of QQ bar. Then your theory has the full symmetry of UNF cross UNF, SUNF cross SUNF without spontaneous symmetry breaking. So that would be a phase where you have confinement without chiosymmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. And whether such a thing uh, is possible or not, it, it's not totally understood. Uh, again, in the case of supersymmetric theory, you have extra handle that you can show indeed such a thing it does happen. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, for generic quantum uh, uh, field theory, we don't really know. So that's what I meant as exotic dynamics. I, I, okay, I understand. okay. So the beta function in that case still, yeah, it looks like the confined case, but it's, mm -hmm. so it's a separate mm -hmm. question. I see. Right. I see. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, have a good weekend, and everybody stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.